Right now at 11, rent on the rise. I wake up every day and go to sleep every night worrying about keeping a roof over my head. While others fight to save their livelihood. But you're fueling the exact fire that you claim to be trying to put out. With Oregon lawmakers now asking when it comes to rent control, how much is too much? Plus, another day, another car thief on the run. Running southbound for the cold attack. An update on the Portland unit that tracks down stolen cars, they say, by working smarter. But first, the deadliest shooting of 2023. It's, it's, it's tragic. The whole thing's tragic. Three people dead, plus three more shootings. It's not just us. It's all of Portland. As neighbors say, no one is safe. Good evening, and as of tonight, there have been no arrests in four separate shootings in Portland over the weekend. Thanks for joining us this Monday. I'm David Molko. Blair Best went back to the scene of a triple homicide in North Portland today and found some neighbors wondering if it was time to move permanently. Three balloons covered in messages of grief mark the lives lost in a shooting that shook this North Portland neighborhood to its core. I couldn't believe it. It's a quiet, nice family neighborhood. But Saturday afternoon, that all changed when three people were shot and killed while driving a car through this intersection. Shocked that this happened. The very idea that this could happen, I, I hear witnesses here said there were 10 to 15 shots. That's a lot of bullets flying around. Now we have knocked on the doors of nearly everyone in this neighborhood and no one will talk with us on record for fear of retaliation. Now as of this morning, police still haven't caught the suspects and neighbors are afraid that the suspects could come back and threaten the neighborhood. I understand how people are frightened here. Absolutely, I Absolutely. would be if it was in my neighborhood. These two women use the Charles Jordan Community Center just steps away from where the shooting took place. It's terrible wherever it happens. Yeah. I mean, it's not just us. It's all of Portland. That was surely felt in many corners of the city this weekend after four confirmed shootings. The first happened Friday night at 1045 at the Alibi Tiki Lounge on North Interstate Ave. One man was injured but is expected to be okay. Things got chaotic with the crowd and during the investigation, one officer was punched. So far, there have been no arrests. About four hours later, early Saturday morning, there was a shooting on Southeast Foster, where two businesses and a vehicle were hit. Police say no one was hurt and no arrests have been made. Nine hours later was the deadly shooting in North Portland, marking the 15th, 16th and 17th homicides in the city this year. Around 2 o'clock Sunday morning, shots were fired on Northeast Haslow and 87th, hitting four houses. One woman there described her window shattering above her head. No one was injured or arrested in that case. People are bolder. They seem to think that it's, you know, that there's no retaliation for them. This string of violence leaves many neighbors with only one answer. It makes us, like, not necessarily want to continue to live in Portland. In North Portland, Blair Best, KGW News. We're learning more tonight about a mass shooting at a Nashville elementary school that killed three nine-year-olds along with three staff members, people who are just starting their Monday morning. Authorities have now released surveillance video that shows how the shooter, who police later shot, got inside the building. Warning here, while you won't see anyone being hurt in the video, it is still disturbing to watch. Let's take a look. You can see glass doors here, which we understand were locked at the time, shattered by the gunfire. The shooter, you're about to see her, then crawls through the door frame and starts walking through the halls of the Covenant School with what appears to be an assault-style firearm there. Minutes later, a call to 911 reported multiple people had been shot. Authorities say they shot the shooter, a 28-year-old woman and former student at the school. About 14 minutes after that first call came in, police say they've come across a detailed map of the school as well as a statement the shooter left behind. New at 11, Portland police say they are getting more effective at spotting and stopping stolen cars. In fact, nearly half the cars they targeted over the weekend turned out to be stolen. Now, PBB has been doing focus missions searching for stolen cars for the last year and a half. They're using data science to help officers hone in on the likely vehicles. This weekend, out of 22 they stopped, nine of those were stolen. Before switching to this approach, police would find roughly one stolen car 
for every 31 they stopped. Officers explained some of the factors they're looking at in the KGW investigation earlier this month. So when we look at a vehicle like this, you look at the fact that there's no plates on the vehicle. You look at the fact that there's a trip permit that may, may not come back to this vehicle. Um, their driving was uh, erratic. It was inappropriate. So that's also another that factor that um, made them realize it. And then when they tried to initiate a traffic stop on it, it ran. It eluded. Sunday's mission spanned neighborhoods that included Roseway, Madison South, Lentz, Mount Scott, Arlita, and Brentwood, Darlington. Officers arrested seven people and issued eight more tickets. Tonight, Oregon lawmakers are considering whether rent controls in the state should be strengthened and loopholes closed at a time when inflation means some tenants are seeing hikes as high as 14 percent. Though, as Catherine Cook reports, some opposed to the bill warn it could have unintended consequences. I'm not joking when I say people like me are going to be the new face of homelessness in Oregon. Catherine Chambers was among the many Oregon renters who sat before lawmakers Wednesday. Robin McMain is another. She drove up from Brookings to represent the seniors in her mobile home community. To make this clear, everyone donated money in order to get me to be able to come up here and talk to you about this today. They all support Senate Bill 611. If passed, it would limit annual rent increases in Oregon to 3 percent plus inflation with a max total increase of 8 percent. Back in 2019, lawmakers limited rent increases to 7 percent plus inflation with no total limit. With inflation what it is these days, that means some renters are staring at a possible 14.6 percent rent increase this year. I live with the constant stress of knowing that if my landlord raises my rent by the allowable 14.6 percent, I will be priced out of my home. My fixed income is just above the threshold to qualify for any assistance but not enough income to pay that kind of rent increase. Several of us are not going to go see our grandkids this year because we can't afford the travel or turn our thermostats down. I have a 94-year-old woman that's wearing a coat every day. Those who support SB 611 suggest it would provide relief to renters without sacrificing the development of new housing. Those who oppose it say nothing could be further from the truth. If anyone thinks that continuing to make being a landlord in Oregon not just difficult, but unfeasible in ways such as this, then I'm here to respectfully tell you that you're fueling the exact fire that you claim to be trying to put out. Kennedy Amundsen owns Propagate Property Management, which serves Yamhill, Polk, and Marion counties. If 611 passes, she believes it would make it hard for housing providers to keep up with repairs in their units and could drive investors to take their money out of state. Continuing to house Oregonians at the sole expense of those providing their housing is not sound public policy and is not a sustainable way to address housing instability. We need to focus on permanent rent assistance and increasing supply. For now, renters like Catherine Chambers bide their time and hope. I wake up every day and go to sleep every night worrying about keeping a roof over my head. Mm. There's a couple more key components to HB 611. Under it, newer buildings would only be exempt from rent control for three years as opposed to 15. And if a landlord sells, renovates or tears down a home, they'd be forced to pay tenants three months rent for relocation assistance if they're evicted. Right now, they only have to pay them one month's rent. The bill is scheduled for a work session on Wednesday. David. Yeah, a lot of perspectives and a lot of moving parts there. Thank you, Catherine. New tonight, Vancouver's mayor has held her state of the city address, one that had a bit of a twist this evening. And McInerney Ogle highlighted a voter approved multi million dollar levy for affordable housing, along with steps toward improving the Vancouver waterfront and downtown area. She acknowledged, though, it's all very much a work in progress. We just keep moving forward with determination and big aspirations to leave this community better from our service. And when the council makes decisions, we're not making it for next year or for the next five years. We're making it for the next generation because we truly are in the forever business. Well, now to the twist in what seems to be a first for Vancouver, the mayor's remarks were followed by a forum. That's where councillor staff and members of the public were invited to sit down in groups for discussions on some of the big issues, everything from homelessness to how to boost the city's economy over the next two decades. One of the largest employers in Clark County, speaking of that, says it is moving its headquarters 
to Texas. Fisher Investment, which is currently based in Camas, says it is in response to Washington's new capital gains tax that was just upheld by the state Supreme Court. Fisher says while it won't entirely shut down the Camas location, some staff will be required to transfer. So the new tax collects 7% on profits made from stock and bond investments only for the state's top investment earners. By the way, the tax was challenged as an illegal income tax. Stay in Clark County. We are watching closely to see if a Vancouver man will be charged with killing his girlfriend and her seven year old daughter. Hundreds of people gathered for a vigil Sunday in Esther Short Park to remember Miche Melendez and Layla Stewart. The mayor, the police chief, close family and friends all spoke and shared memories. Close friends with Layla and Miche. Layla was pretty much my niece. So yeah, this has been very heartbreaking. We really want to honor the family and make sure they get like lots of support for their that um, Layla and her mom is gone. Yeah, police found the bodies of Melendez and her daughter last Wednesday. Miche's boyfriend Kirkland Warrant is in custody on other charges, including murder in Arkansas. Authorities say he remains a person of interest in this case, and we, of course, will keep you updated.